Thank you for that. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Chris Purdy. I'm the Vice President of Member Services at TCEC. And uh, glad we can come out and give this update. I want to let you know a little bit about the operations of TCEC, what we're doing uh, right now during the COVID-19. Our lobby remains closed. Uh, we have not seen uh, any complaints uh, about that. We're continuing to do business as, as usual. Uh, we do have employees working remotely. They are working from, from home, and we do have our crews staggered at this time. Uh, it is storm season, and we want to make sure that uh, we do have healthy crews, so that's the uh, idea behind staggering the crews. Uh, hopefully, our members aren't seeing any, any dip in the quality of service. Uh, we're not hearing of any, so we hope to keep that uh, high-quality service still going. We have suspended our disconnects and uh, late fees. Uh, that is something we've been doing for quite some time. We do encourage uh, members to, if, if you're having falling on hard times and you cannot uh, pay, we're not going to cut you off, but we do encourage you to pay anything that you can towards your bill. And then that will just go on as a credit. So continue to do so. We're going to still send reminder phone calls. So if you do fall behind, you're going to get a reminder phone call. You will not be disconnected during this time, but you'll get the reminder call. And uh, Zach Perkins, our CEO, has sent out a few notes, uh, postcards, uh, to those that are affected with the past due balances. Uh, some of the barriers um, on this is that we don't know when we're going to come back and resume normal. And I don't think, I think everybody that's talked, we really don't know when that time frame is. We do have a, a TCEC board meeting tomorrow. We'll be having those discussions. And when we do come back, we'll be coming back in phases. So we have several phases to come back and not all employees will come back at the same time. Uh, before the entire company went home and, and is working from home and, and doing the staggering, we had a small crew at the office and we plan to return that small crew back to the office and then we will end up uh, having the entire uh, personnel, some of the, some personnel that do work from other towns, they may still work from home, but we are utilizing technology to the, the best of our ability. We're able to still process our billing from home. We're able to take all member calls from home and uh, Hopefully you're seeing that that's still working forward, uh, still working good. Uh, we did post some payment assistance options on our website. If you go to tcec.coop slash assistance or look under my service, you will be able to see uh, uh, payment assistance options there. So we encourage you to go uh, look at that as well. Also, the Oklahoma Department of Human Services has information at www dot okdhslive.org if you need help with that. Um, with that, uh, if you have any questions, you can always call TCEC. We'll be glad to answer your questions or go to TCEC's website at www.tcec.coop. Thank you for your time. Are you going to be able to hear me with this on? Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rochelle Leva. I am the safety and work comp manager for Seaboard Foods. I am also a coordinator for the COVID team out there right now. Um, our goal right now is to say, uh, stay safe while focused on producing quality food for tables across America. We'd like to first and foremost thank Texas County Health Department, the Oklahoma, the Oklahoma State Department of Health, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as they've been um, very helpful in everything that we have going on out here right now. We did mass testing out there at Seaboard on May 11th, 12th, and 13th. Um, some of the things that we've implemented during, um, you know, uh, some of the time before we started and after the mass testing, uh, we've imp implemented, because everybody wants to know, uh, we've imp implemented face masks, face shields, uh, temperature checks while you're entering the building. If uh, we find anybody with the temperature, they're sent home immediately, and they have to have a doctor, they have to see a doctor, have a doctor's note, and able to be uh, returned to work. 
Uh, we ask if anybody's ill, they stay home and seek medical attention. Uh, we've increased our, no, um, increased our number of touch-free sanitizers. Uh, we're sanitizing with antibacterial and antiviral cleansers daily around the plant and in um, office areas. In, we've uh, increased our custodial staff. We've done physical distancing, implementing barriers and markers throughout the common areas and on the floor. We've implemented plexiglass dividers in select workstations and uh, the cafeteria tables and cash registers. We put in additional clock in and clock out stations. Uh, we've also implemented testing of newly hired employees, so they have to be tested and be negative before they start um, work and before they go to orientation. We've also been helping with contact tracing uh, for the health department and testing of employees. So um, if we have an employee that is found to be negative, we, we remove that employee help with, um, help the health department with getting that employee and any family members or anybody in that same residence out of the building and helping the health department do some of those things. So uh, one of the things uh, we all know when you go to the supermarket, there's no meat on on the on the stands right now or on the shelves and so we want to uh, our you know one of our main goals is to be safe we want to remain operational with the federal state and local health authorities um, and we want to make sure that we still provide quality uh, meat for for across America as well as keeping our employees safe uh, we continue to adapt our practices for much needed food for the country as well as this has been a continuing changing process as we go by, as, as time has, con has, as time has uh, passed here. So as of May 25th, um, we have tested, there's been over 2,500 tests administered. Um, some people have tested three, four times. And um, like I said, we did that mass testing May 11th, uh, 12th and 13th. Okay, we have some community questions for you. One was, uh, what is the total exact amount of positive cases for Seaboard employees? I believe that's a result of the testing, mass testing. Okay, um, during that testing that day, um, we did the majority of our testing on May 12th. Um, that day we had close to 1,700 tests done, 1,670 right in that area. Um, and we had 350 positive tests that day. So that um, came out to about 20% uh, of our tests. And we also have, um, at this time, we only have 90 outstanding cases, and that's company-wide. That's not just from that testing. So we strongly encouraged people to take the test, but we didn't feel that it was um, something, we kind of considered that a medical, not, not really a medical procedure, but we wanted to make sure employees had the option to do it. We had over 92% of our employees partake in that, and I think everybody really you know, liked it, but we also didn't want to tell employees that they had to do it. Um, as you guys know, we have many cultures out there at Seaboard, and not everybody um, agrees with medical um, procedures in all of uh, the cultures that we have. So we did not want to make it a mandatory um, process. We wanted to give employees um, the, the, the opportunity to do it if they wanted to. And we, we had a really good out, uh, out turn on that. Okay, and the last one is, can we, the public, help Seaboard? So, um, the one thing I guess, it, you know, if I had anything to say is I guess, you know, we, I try to stay off of Facebook now and all that good stuff, but um, one of the things is I guess to be more understanding um, about what we're going through um, as well as um, understand we have been working with the state, you know, uh, the local health department, the state health department with CDC. Um, we've um, implemented everything that we can think of, and we continue doing that. We continue making changes. Our goal is to keep our employees safe. We don't want to see anybody sick or anybody come down with this. Um, 
Um, but it's also doesn't stop at when the employee walks out of that, those four walls. It continues on outside of there. And so um, I think at some point, you know, people have to understand it's not just inside those four walls. And, and we appreciate the understanding and we want you guys, everybody to know, the whole community to know that um, we have the best interest of our employees in mind. And that's always our, gonna be our main focus, um, as well as, um, you know, keeping, keeping meat process and, and all that at going. Um, and so um, I guess just understanding, but, and, and, and kind of giving the health department and all that a break as well. We're, we're doing everything that we can and we continue, we continue changing as, as this thing changes. And as, as we hear, hey, you guys need to do this. Okay, we'll change along with that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. I'm Angela Rhodes and I'm the superintendent of Guymon Public Schools and <clears throat> obviously we have not been back to school since we left for spring break March 13th so since that time we um, just like many other schools across the state nation have had to roll out something that was not ideal for our students to be educated but we did the best we could in a short amount of time so we were able to um, you know, do online virtual learning with 7th through 12th grades, and then we did paper pencil packets for our elementary age. Wasn't perfect um, by any means, and as we plan for the future education-wise, our goal right now is that we will return to school as normal in August. Um, but, you know, we do know that we have to have Plan A and Plan B and Plan C, and so my team is constantly working on that. We are looking for guidance from the State Department of Education, which they will be hopefully pushing out to us sometime this next week. Uh, but through this shutdown, we were able to deep clean all of our buildings uh, and do some improvements around so that when students return in the fall, it will have a new look for them. We were able to provide graduation to our seniors. It was not traditional by any means, but it was something that was special for them and it was neat to see them in their element. We were able to do that on Friday and Saturday and lots of people were able to decorate their vehicle and do some really fun things. So even though it wasn't traditional, um, we were able to do the best we could under the circumstances. Uh, we will begin um, opening up our campuses uh, for summer pride and camps June 15th. OSSAA released that everything would return to normal June 1st. However, the city of Guymon is under a proclamation until June 9th. So we felt like June 15th would be a good time for us to open back up so that our, our student athletes could um, get back into the groove of things. Uh, we will have strict guidelines when we return June 15th. Uh, temperatures will be taken. Students are asked to encourage to bring their own water bottle, their own towel. Uh, we will be sanitizing all the equipment and everything after each use. So we, we have some strict guidelines that we will be pushing out on social media as that gets closer. Uh, the barriers that we had to face, obviously technology was still an issue for us, uh, not being able to get technical devices in every student's hands. So when we return in the fall, that is one of the areas that we're looking at. We will spend a virtual day every day in every classroom, preparing kids to log into certain uh, software programs. We'll be purchasing a software program to where they won't have to remember 14 passwords or logins. It will be one login, one password that will get them into everything that they will need. And we're working on getting technology into every student's hand. if we should go to another short um, distance learning program. Communication is still a barrier for us with the different languages, but we're also looking at some other platforms that we can use to help with those barriers um, to provide a better two-way communication. 
I do want to say that I'm very proud of my staff. It was a hard time for them, it, just as it was for parents and students, of not having closure to say goodbye to your teacher. And so, you know, my staff went above and beyond and did little parades through the town and things like that, just so that they could have as much closer closure as the students. And then they took the time to call their students weekly to check in on them. So I, I appreciate my staff for standing up and, and doing what we could in, in these unprecedented precedented times. Our future plans, as I said before, working on plan A, plan B, and plan C. Right now we are planning to start school as normal August 14th. I say as normal as possible. We will have some restrictions that we will put into place. I know that people have seen out there that the CD, they thought it was the CDC guidelines on Facebook, which were not um, feasible for anybody to be able to do. We're not going to be able to transport one kid in one seat of the bus. I mean, we'd have to start transporting at 3 a.m., and that's not feasible. So the CDC guidelines are that. They're guidelines. And we will do what we feel is best to keep our students and our staff safe but to also get them to school so that we can get them in a classroom and, and go back to a normal traditional educational if possible. Now, we do realize that um, you know there, there could be some fear in returning and we'll work with parents on an individual basis if we need to look at some online or blended learning because we want kids to get um, an education and feel, but feel comfortable and safe when they come to school. So those will be part of our plan B's and C's and D's as we move forward. Um, I, I hate to say that we're going to do this, this, and this because it could change tomorrow. Um, but right now we are planning for a normal start um, with some of that looking different as we move forward. And as, as we get more information and come up with those plans, we'll post them on our district Facebook page, on our district website, and we'll push out through our school messenger as well. So just be looking for updates um we'll we'll do we'll push out as much as we have but like i said we are looking for guidance too from the state department of education before we start making um plans that may not fit some of the guidelines that the state department um deems as necessary we will be going to online enrollment for school new student and returning students and that will push out june 15th um we will begin our summer feeding program. We did nine sites during the shutdown. We will be going to four sites starting June 1st through July 24th. And those sites will be Dell Park, Garland Square, Academy, and North Park. So um, that will get, and then the, the serving times would be 11.30 to 12.30 and you will, it will be grab and go drive up, grab and go again, and um, you'll get a breakfast and lunch at each pickup. So um, I think that's all the updates I have for Gaiman Public Schools. Okay, thank you. All right, my name is Tim Fulton. I am honored to be the president of Oklahoma Panhandle State University. Uh, I'd like to begin today by thanking our partners, uh, the city of Guymon, the city of Goodwill, really the entire Panhandle, the Guymon Public School System, the uh, Goodwill Public School System. Our friends at the county have done an amazing job. I want a, a special shout out to my friend Grant and Matt Boley. They have done just amazing work. Of course, the state has been a blessing to us. Uh, as well as the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education, um, as well as the Oklahoma A&M Board of Education. I think without them and the support network, we would not have been able to have, to have weathered this as much as we could have. I would be dumb if I started any other way than to say that I have some of the best faculty in the United States of America. We literally turned on a dime. We closed on March 13th. We went away for spring break and we came back and we were a complete online college. Our uh, retention rate was higher this spring than it was last spring with a normal and traditional schedule. And that's because my people went above and beyond and I couldn't be any more proud of them, their adaptability. And then of course the students stepped up in a big way doing it differently than they'd ever done before. And that was, uh, 
It was inspiring actually to see their flexibility and it encouraged me about what the future of education and really the future of this country is about. One of the things that most people don't know is that when you graduate with a bachelor's degree, you will, uh, you'll make about a million dollars more over the course of your lifetime. And sometimes you see these students walk across the graduation stage and you wonder what the future is going to be like. After this hard time, I don't think our future has ever been brighter. So we feel really good about that. They asked me to talk about what happened. Uh, we closed to the public on March 13th, 2020. We went to complete online learning seven days later. Uh, and I can't tell you what, what a turn that was, and I can't tell you how difficult that was, and I can't tell you how proud of how well we emerged out of that situation. They asked me to talk a little bit about the organization of Oklahoma Panhandle State. I think in terms of context, in terms of how this has impacted us and what the possible impact might be uh, on our region. We're about a $22 million organization. We employ about 1,000 employees. I am proud to tell you that we're one of the few public college and universities uh, in the state of Oklahoma, really in our region, that had no layoffs whatsoever. So everybody who was working with us at that time is working with us today. We've had uh, essential personnel on campus uh, every day following all the CDC uh, guidelines and all of the safety and sanitation protocols as well as social distancing since uh, March 13th. And we've been working to make sure that we are ready when it's time to return to campus. So we feel really good about that. Like I said, we have about 1,000 employees. I think this one's kind of interesting. We, uh, OPSU is like a little town all unto itself. So we have about 500 people living in faculty housing. At any given time, we have anywhere between uh, 500 and 700 students living uh, on campus. And so when you close to the public on March 13th, it took us almost an entire month to get everybody to a safe spot. And so the interesting thing about that is everybody followed all the rules and everybody did it the way they were supposed to. To our knowledge, we have had two positive cases, uh, both recovered out of the employees and out of the students coming out of OPSU at that time. So we feel very, very good about that. One of the things I think most people are very interested in is the CARES Act funding. We received $930,000 in CARES Act funding, about, not about, 441000 went back to the students in direct aid. As far as I know, all of that has been dispersed to those students. We also did refunds on a prorated basis for our uh, housing, for uh, the students who had meal plans, as well as every student who had paid certain mandatory fees that were no longer applicable because of the, uh, because of the virus and because they couldn't be on campus. We estimate up to this point that we will have spent, by the time we open up for fall, we will have spent a little over a million dollars in new uh, safety and sanitation things. So it'll be everything uh, from uh, what we do with our ventilation systems to face masks to sanitation stations to all of the screening uh, equipment that, that we need. And so that's something that I think is important for people to know. We are invested and we are ready. As far as the future coming up, we anticipate uh, that we will roll out a phased open up plan next Monday. We will bring back certain personnel on June 8th. We will bring back another wave of personnel on June 22nd, and we will come back full force on July 5th. This phase opening uh, is designed to make sure that we get all of the testing and that we get all of the screening done for all of our people coming back so that we're ready for the students when they return in the fall. Um, I'm looking at my notes here. I think uh, probably the biggest thing that people will be interested in on campus thus far is we have continued with essential personnel to do all of the campus improvements to make sure that we are ready when it's time to open back up. So we feel good about where we are. I would encourage you to come drive around campus. Not allowed to get out of your car yet, but you can sure come around campus. It is beautiful. I'm proud of where we are. I'm proud of who we are, and I'm proud of how we're doing it. So I would encourage you to come over uh, and check all of that out. One of the things they asked me to talk about was the academic impact. The biggest one that breaks my heart is we canceled graduation. We're gonna have a graduation ceremony uh, in December. It's gonna be bigger and better. As far as I know, in our 110 year history, it will be the only one, Jenna, that will have been done uh, in December. For those of you who don't know, there's a, there's a young lady sitting in front of me that was set to graduate this spring. So we're gonna go ahead and take care of that then. 
I'd encourage you to go to opsu.edu. You can see all of the coronavirus uh, measures that we've taken. You can, take, you can see everything uh, that we've done academically, as well as see what the open up plan looks like there. Um, moving forward, we, uh, on top of all of the chaos that has been created by this, uh, OPSU received a 4% budget cut from the state for next year, uh, which we, uh, we thought was, you know, not as bad as it could have been. And so we feel pretty good about that. I will present a budget in two weeks to the Oklahoma and the Oklahoma a and Board of Regents that will have no furloughs, no reduction in force, and only frozen positions. And so we feel really good about that. There are so many people in our area that are dependent on the jobs, and there are so many people in our area that are dependent on our brand of education. We don't want to see that dip at all. We've been blessed to be successful in the last three years. This is truly a rainy day. And so we're going to use some of those rainy day funds to make sure uh, that that goes forward. Interestingly enough, one of the things that have, that have come out of this, we realized that we had a much greater level of capacity and a much greater level of expertise in online education. So starting in the fall of 2020, we will have our own online college with a separate dean leadership and a separate faculty so that we can take all of our programs completely online. The idea is you want students to have as many opportunities to fulfill their dreams. And so what we do really better than anybody else is we meet students where they are and we get them where they want to go. We didn't know we were this good at online education. And because we're this good at online education, we're going to try to open up a college of online education and we're going to take it to the next level to give our students everything that they have, every opportunity, every opportunity that they possibly can have. I am happy to answer any personal questions that anybody might have at any time about what the open up plan will be, what the testing and screening procedures will be. We feel like that's going to be about as robust as any college or university in the state of Oklahoma. So we will have some mobile testing. I believe my good friend uh, Grant calls them swab pods. So we're going to have some of those when we bring back uh, all of our employees to make sure that we're as safe as possible. Last thing I would say really doesn't have much to do with OPSU other than I've been blessed to be a part of a group of people that have been charged with communicating the impact of this virus on our area and on our region. And if you knew what I knew, and if you knew how smart I had seen all of the decision makers in the county, in the region, in the city, if you knew how everybody had stepped up and put the safety of everybody else ahead of their own, you would be inspired. And it has helped me to understand that no man's land is where I want to be. No questions? Go Aggies. My name is Spencer Leiter. I'm the EMS chief for the Guyman Fire Department. Um, we've taken a lot of measures in preparation for um, COVID. We've, one of the things we've done is we've increased, we looked at the CDC's recommendations for what we should be doing and how often we should be checking our employees if they have all been exposed. And then right off the bat, we implemented that as our screening process for our employees. So all of our employees are screened when they come in the door and then every, um, and then three other times throughout their shift. They're screened at two o'clock in the afternoon at eight o'clock in the evening, and then at eight o'clock the next morning before they leave to go home. So we're just watching them to, to see if they have any symptoms, if they have cough, fever, shortness of breath, so that if those things do show up, we can send them home. We're not sending them to people's houses with symptoms. And if they do get sick, then we can take them off of those trucks and, and stop them from responding as quickly as possible. In addition to that, we have implemented some uh, very aggressive uh, decontamination measures. Uh, we're decontaminating all of our trucks um, frequently and after every uh, potential COVID patient so that we're making sure that those trucks are clean and ready for the next um, patient and that we're not cross-contaminating with, with one patient um, compared to the next. So um, we are spraying down our, our trucks with a decontaminate, de decontaminant um, making sure that they get a good dry time. And then all of our crews are also taking a shower uh, after every potential COVID patient, just to make sure that everything stays clean. Um, as far as barriers, 
obviously in, initially there was a, a shortage of PPE um, and we didn't initially start to see a whole lot of COVID calls. And so fortunately we were able to uh, stock up enough PPE uh, to last us through that shortage. And then we started receiving some uh, additional supplies of uh, protective equipment uh, through the uh, Medical Emergency Reserve Corps and, and be able to have enough PPE to, so that our responders have the PPE that they need uh, whenever they respond to any emergency. Uh, another challenge that we faced is that um, once we did start to see the, the calls for COVID patients, uh, we started to run short on, on ambulances. Um, so we were able to call on the state and, and have some uh, regional emergency medical services uh, system crews come out and help support the Guyman Fire Department. Uh, we're very grateful to the communities who loaned us their ambulances and crews uh, to do 48-hour shifts here in Guyman to help facilitate uh, patient transport so that we could make sure that all of the patients made it uh, to the hospital that they needed to be in in order to receive the, the appropriate, appropriate care. Uh, and I think we've seen some great outcomes and, and we've seen a lot of uh, support and help uh, from our community and throughout the state. Good evening. I'm Fire Chief Grant Wadley. I am um, also the incident commander of our command post that we put on probably, well, almost two months ago now. What we're looking for the future is, is one thing. Our mission with the Guyman Fire Department is treat and transport the sick and injured. This includes the illness that we're going around with the COVID. COVID is still not gone. Still, COVID is still here. Um, we are going to see um, COVID patients off and on, I believe, for many, many months to come. But I believe the surge that we have seen in the last probably 10 days and before uh, has passed. Uh, we're seeing uh, numbers starting to decrease. We're seeing patients being admitted to hospitals decreasing, and not just within Guyman, but the entire three-state area, which includes from Amarillo into the Oklahoma Panhandle and to southwest Kansas up around Dodge City and, and Garden City. Those are the paths that we have seen for the many, many months going on, and that's what we've been prepared for. So what are we also doing for the future? We're Number one, also, we're looking at our protection, protecting our own uh, using PPE. We were having to redo our policies and procedures on how to enter people's homes, um, working with 911 coordinators, uh, 911 dispatchers on asking certain questions when, they get, when people call in for type emergencies. We're also helping other first responders, such as our police department, our sheriff, other communities with their EMS services, their fire services, on a lot of the, the preventions that we're doing and also the deconning that we're doing. Uh, as Chief Leiter explained, we're very uh, proactive um, with our deconning. Um, we've had, I think, upwards of probably over 40 cases that we've been uh, part of. And to this, to this date, our personnel have actually stayed very well. I think that goes with them for number one, doing the right things doing keeping keeping their PPE in place when exposed to these people that actually have the COVID known knowingly having COVID because it's very difficult in the back of an ambulance as you can tell we're within close proximity less than six feet we have to wear our PPE we're talking about the sickest of the sickest people that we're seeing and our paramedics are having to stay right with them the entire time and treating and caring for them for the entire journey whether it's from the home or whether it's from hospital to hospital, whatever the case may be, we will continue on. We are looking at uh, partnering up with uh, many other agencies, again, like the police departments, the sheriff's departments, and ongoing our training on how to better prevent uh, exposure to the COVID and many other things. In EMS, we, this, is, this is something that is, is here, COVID, but we have other many things that we worry about every day, such as hepatitis. We also have, um, many other things uh, I can't even mention them all uh, that would just scare you to death that we see daily so our future still looks very bright we are still going to be here to take care and transport and treat people that need it we are going to transport patients to hospitals that still need it we will still be here to take care of Guyman and the community thank you
I'm Harold Tyson. I'm the Texas County Emergency Management Director. And sometimes people ask, what do I do? And I like to say, well, I'm the best paid goofing off person there is in the county until about three months ago. And we have really been uh, humping it out, getting uh, things that need to be going. My main job is to make sure that our fire departments, our law enforcement, our schools now that we're starting to work with, our other uh, clinics and things have enough uh, PPEs and other supplies uh, to get them through this uh, predicament that we're in. At first, when we started, we didn't have anything. We were really pressed for just gloves and masks and PPEs and all that. And now I'm happy to announce the states come through and we have plenty of what we need. We definitely have uh, a lot of uh, hand sanitizer now. And we have uh, a disinfectant that the state sent up. They sent me 330 gallons of that. Uh, so we're pushing that out everywhere that we can uh, to get that the same way with our hand sanitizer. Of course, our mask and our PPEs and our gloves uh, are staying with our, our fire departments, our law enforcement, and uh, our schools. We're starting to work now with our schools too and our clinics. I. Is there any questions that we needed to do? Yes, sir. One of the questions is, has the emergency management distributed all of their allocated disinfectants? No, we don't, haven't distributed it all. We still have plenty. Uh, we're working on that, aren't we, Mirandy? Miranda? Mirandy? Crash? Uh, we still have quite a bit. I think I have a little over 15 gallons of it, of hand sanitizer. And still, I have probably still close to uh, 250 uh, to 300 gallons of that ant, uh, and disinfectant that we can spray out. The next question is, what system do you have in place to stop the inaccurate information and slow response in the future? I, sorry, I don't understand. What did you say? You need to take your mask off so you can talk. No, you don't. No, no. <laughs> so what system is in place to stop the inaccurate information? Our information is correct, okay? We get our information from the health department. We get our information from the state department. Our uh, Oklahoma emergency management people give us information, and we put everything down together. Uh, even 911, we're getting information, and I guarantee you that the information that we have that goes on our Facebook page is correct. Some people are disagreeing with our, okay, positive and negatives and recovered and things like that. That's only numbers, okay? We, at one time, were number two in the state. Now we're back to number three, I'm glad, for uh, this uh, virus. Uh, and our numbers are coming down, which it really looks good. And we're looking at going into maybe some other phases of uh, trying to get things going. Good, thank you. Good evening. I'm Sarah Wagner. I'm the CEO of Panhandle Counseling and Health Center. Um, I'm excited to give you guys just a brief update kind of of um, what our operations look like and some of the things that we put in place to continue to serve our patients. Um, we have changed our protocol for seeing patients. Uh, we kind of change it as needed. We have leadership calls every day, um, weekly calls on the state level and federal level so that we make sure that we are in the loop with what funds are available, um, and then really just how to best serve our patients. So currently, we are um, open at both our highway location and our E Street location. However, we do have our doors locked at all times. We, um, we screen all of our employees when they enter the building, and then, of course, all of the patients who enter the building. We do triage all of our patients from their vehicle and then um, make sure that it's safe for them to enter the, the building. Um, we have continued with seeing patients on site for those who it's appropriate for. And then we have also really beefed up our telemedicine services. Um, we are doing all of our behavioral health services via telemedicine. 
And we've really done that just to kind of limit the exposure uh, possibility for all, of our for all of our employees and other patients. And that allows us to offer all of our services outside of um, just med seeing medical patients. So we have received, um, through the CARES Act and a couple of other funding opportunities through HRSA, we've received um, about $780,000 and those have kind of come in waves and of course always come with guidelines and so we've tried to take the opportunity for some of those funds where appropriate um, to kind of push those back out through the community so we of course like everybody else had a hard time securing ppe in the beginning and so we really try to get creative on how we could start to flatten the curve in our community um, so we have um, been able to really kind of reinvest those funds locally and try to kind of stimulate the local economy. We were able to purchase um, 90 UV HEPA units, um, filters that we uh, bought here locally and then were able to put in each resident room at the Heritage Living uh, Community. We've also sprayed at several locations in town, including the Oaks of Mamre and the YMCA and several other daycares to make sure that we um, do everything we can to help kind of take that financial burden of cleaning those spaces and keeping people safe in those locations. So um, that was part of, it's always been part of our mission, you know, to, to look outside the box to serve our patients and our community, not just uh, meet their medical needs, but also see what other needs that, that we can meet for our community. So as I mentioned, we do have daily leadership calls. Really, we know it's a fluid situation and we try to adjust our protocols as needed. Um, we are really looking forward to going back to business as usual. Um, we will kind of slowly increase our face-to-face -face visits. We have started back our DOT physicals and um, the next kind of phase will be implementing back our immigration physicals and re kind of reignite that program and then hopefully um, if we get to go back to school, we'll be uh, up and ready in time for vaccines and back to school physicals. So that's, our, that's what we're all looking forward to right now. We very much um, miss our normal um, volume of patients and getting to see our patients. Um, kind of for the future, we, are, we will probably always have some sort of telemedicine services. As I mentioned, we are certainly looking forward to having our face-to-face -face visits, but we have kind of seen through this time that there is certainly a, a population that really respond well to doing telemedicine, and we're able to accomplish a lot via telemedicine. So we will um, continue to have that as an option in some capacity, and so um, we're looking forward to kind of putting some additional technologies in place to make that easier for both our patients and our providers. Um, outside of that, we are still kind of looking to secure additional PPE and testing kits. Um, we are trying to work closely with all of our local community partners, uh, again, as our state and federal partners as well, to make sure that we continue to um, serve our community and serve our patients and keep them safe. So I don't think I had any questions. Okay, thank you guys for doing this. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Mitch Egger, and I'm here to represent the City of Guymon, uh, Councilman. So what we have been doing to try to keep the, the community and everybody abreast of what's going on is we've been having weekly meetings at the City Council to kind of assess where we're at and what needs to happen. <clears throat> we've been having bi-weekly staff meetings as a city with the managers and those folks that are in those rooms. Uh, we also, through all that, have been following the CDC guidelines. Um, we get all of our information out via Facebook and the city website. Uh, one of the things, too, is on the city website, a lot of people may not know this, there's a link or a page dedicated to the citizens that will give you all the state and local proclamations that are out there uh, that have been introduced. Um, so we, we're doing our best to do that. Uh, some of our barriers that we've, we've fallen against is just the umbrella of communication, communication into us and communication out. Uh, we rely on the state health department to, for a lot of our information, obviously we're not health experts. We also uh, use the Texas County uh, Emergency Management System. And so a lot of our numbers sometimes too, I know have come up and we've had a lot of questions about they don't jive. Part of the reasoning for that is Guymon was climbing at such a high rate. What would happen is we'd have people who were 
not necessarily placed in the right place. So Guymon kind of has its own count and then Texas County as a whole has its own count. We also have a lot of people who live outside the community in different states such as Liberal and other places. So those numbers seem like they move a lot, but that's part of the reasoning behind that. Uh, I really appreciate everything. You can't imagine how much work the health department has done for one to put this on. The CDC seaboard has been very great to work with as a city and help us with information. The hospital, the emergency management system, it's a been a real community effort to try to drive this thing forward and try to get rid of the COVID. So, questions? Okay, what steps has the city taken to ensure the mayor's proclamation has been followed by citizens and what are the repercussions? Wow. So, we're, we're patrolling this like any other ordinance that we would do in the community, no matter what it is. A citizen will make a complaint or someone will make a complaint or we'll see something. We will then address the situation from there. The code department has been helping us to carry out the COVID uh, issues that we have. So the first time the COVID, I guess COVID police or uh, code enforcement will show up, they will go out to the person or the business the first time, issue them a writ, uh, verbal warning, and then try to do some education with them. The, all of our code enforcement officers have had education from the fire department through the CDC. So that's the first time. The second time they'll go out if the problem persists, they will then write a written warning. And if the problem still continues to no avail, we will issue a citation. What steps has the city taken to inform the large migrant population of resources available to them during the pandemic, such as public testing and information? So that's, a, that's uh, back to that umbrella of communication. It's really tough in this area. Um, I'm not for sure I hear a different term every day, but I think we have close to 28 different languages in our town or more, probably 28 plus languages. Um, the majority of that being English and Spanish, so we always make sure that we get that out onto our website. Uh, but we also, when we issue something like that, send it out to the Chamber of Commerce and Main Street Guymon, which are two of our public affiliates that help us to disseminate that information out to the public. <clears throat> we also work very close with Seaboard on a lot of things. They have uh, ways that they can translate and get those things to the correct people. We, we use, for instance, the Burmese have a, uh, a pasture here, so we'll use him a lot to disseminate that information out. So it's, uh, it is a big process, and I think sometimes that's why some of the information lags is the translation issues. I know even in our court system and other things like that, we sometimes have trouble finding a translator, even at the health department level too, that we can, we can translate that. So information is very tough in this area. Okay, I believe you answered this one previously, but just for clarification, since we do have it from the community. The question is, who is in charge of enforcing our city guidelines as businesses aren't following them? So the, the code enforcement agents are the ones going out to do that. Uh, they're the ones following that. The violation of a city council's emergency proclamation is subject to a municipal fine under section 108, 1-108 of the municipal <coughs> code paragraph five, proclamation six. Um, if, if a citizen is charged with a complaint and filed and they have a citation, that will be carried out and followed up on by the DA of Texas County. So. And the last question, why does the city continue to go back and forth instead of sticking on one set plan? So, will you restate that question? Sorry. Yes. Why does the city continue to go back and forth instead of sticking on one set plan? So I think we can all agree this is a very fluid situation. We have to adjust as we get information. Um, and we have to do it quickly for, to do what's best for our citizens of all nationalities and backgrounds. Um, all businesses, uh, none of us as city councilmen, none of us as healthcare administrators or anybody ever wanted to be put in the situation that we're in now. Um, nobody could have understood the scope, even though they tell you that, you still can't quite understand it. Um, we also understand through this, the city had a lot of issues or not issues, we had a lot of things that we didn't realize we didn't have in place, such as ordinances to handle this type of situation. Bicker cities have had some other things happen. We personally didn't have a state of emergency on our books. 
So one of the things I think that became confusing through this process was there's an ordinance, which is what we pull the stuff, pull the information from to build a proclamation. A proclamation is what we issue <clears throat> so that those laws and can be carried out. So originally when this all came out and the governor, because we have very much as a community followed the state guidelines that uh, Governor Stitt has rolled out. So as that all came out, we realized we didn't have a way to, we didn't have the ordinances in place to build the proclamation from. So one thing we did is we drafted an ordinance to then pull that, those items out of there individually to use as a proclamation. So that's, that came from uh, a much higher level than us, the ordinances did. We then issued the proclamation. One thing that we realized through this too, and this has been a big learning curve as I said, and we've done the best we can do, is that this is written by attorneys. So it is very, very hard to understand. You know, do we wear a mask, do we not? Is it mandated? Uh, one of the issues is we are not taking away your guns. I know that was out there in the ordinances. We are not doing that, it is not in the proclamation. So with that said, one of the things we're gonna do is try to gen generate a synopsis each time we have something like that out there that puts it more in layman's terms so that we can all understand uh, those type of situations. I think we've done the best we could do with what we had, um, as all of us have. I think we're in very much, every, as everybody knows, rural America, and you could probably draw a line from Garden City to Amarillo, Texas, and we all kind of got caught in a bad situation. Uh, so, but we've made the best of it, and I think our cases are now down to 87 active, and I'm sure you guys have heard those numbers, or 81 active, and. It is, uh, I mean, we, are, we feel like we're starting to get ahead of it, so. All right, thank you guys. Hello, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan Stiles and I'm the administrator of Heritage Community, Dunaway Manor here in Guymon. First, I wanna clear up some confusion that's been going around town. Dr. W.F. and Maida Dunaway N Nursing Home of Guyman, Inc. was founded in 1962 by Dr. Dunaway, his wife Maida, and other citizens in Texas County. It is not owned or affiliated with anyone else. It was set up to run from 1962 forward with a board of at least five and no more than 12 citizens of Texas County. It is a 501c3 under IRS rules and regulations and is a nonprofit entity. Heritage Community is the assisted living that contains 28 regular assisted living apartments and 15 memory care assisted living apartments, and it is owned and licensed to Dr. W.F. and Maida Dunaway Manor Nursing Home of Guymon, Inc. We are also licensed by the Oklahoma State Department of Health, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, and the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. Therefore, we can accept Medicare and Medicaid in the manner. In the manner, we provide physical therapy, occupational therapy, rehabilitation, IV therapy, long-term care, and respite care. That in the heritage assisted living, we provide assisted living, memory assisted living, and respite care. In the assisted living, we cannot accept Medicare or Medicaid because it is an assisted living and Oklahoma does not allow Medicare or Medicaid to pay. In the manner, Medicare can pay for those who have been in the hospital for at least a three midnight stay and need rehabilitation or therapy of some type. So I hope everyone understands that a little bit. We are not owned by anyone. We're not affiliated with the county or the city. We are a freestanding nonprofit. So basically, the citizens of Texas County, you set us up in 1962 along with Dr. Maida, Dr. Dunaway and his wife Maida. And that's where we, how we got here. Our current census is 43 in the manor, 27 in the assisted living, and nine in the memory care for a total of 79. Prior to, prior to this COVID outbreak, our census was running a total somewhere between 85 and 90, so it has gone down due to COVID. One of the reasons for that is that people don't want to put grandma in Dunaway Manor if they can't come visit her, which they can't. On March 14th, 2020, we were put on lockdown by President Trump, the CMS, and then two days later, also by Governor Stitt. So during this lockdown, temperatures of all of the neighbors in the building are taken once per shift, and they are assessed for any signs and symptoms of COVID. 
and all team members have their temperature taken three times per shift and are assessed at the beginning of their shift for any signs and symptoms of COVID. Any team member that exhibits any signs is immediately sent home. They have to see the personal physician or get COVID tested. We've had three neighbors so far test positive for COVID since this pandemic began and two of our neighbors, our team members. First two neighbors were a husband and wife that were sent to us. At, she had been a patient for some time with us and she was sent to Liberal to the hospital because she was in what we call end of life situation. The husband was allowed to go with her. And then after three weeks there, they decided that there was nothing more they could do and sent her back to us for end of life. The husband came with her because she's on end of life. And that is allowed in the CMS guidelines and regulations that a family member can be there. Two days after they arrived, we got called by the liberal hospital and told, guess what? We have a nurse that tested positive. She took care of them. So you need to test. So our health department here in town came and tested both of them. And eventually both of them tested positive. This, so when they got to us, because this has been a lot of questions from people, they were immediately put in isolation. We had already built an isolation pod on the East Hall where we could isolate them. So they, Grant and his team brought them in the side doors. They were put in isolation. They were never allowed out of that pod. Then they were tested. Once one of them tested positive, and an RN or an LPN and a CNA or CMA were with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That nurse and CNA or CMA never left the pod. They never went into the regular building. When they left after their 48 hours on duty, they left by the side door and went home. If they didn't go home, as one of them didn't because she had an elderly mother at home, then they stayed in an empty apartment in the assisted living. But they were gowned, gloved, and masked up and allowed to go in the side door of the assisted living straight into that apartment. And they didn't leave it for the 48 hours they were off duty. So no one was ever exposed to those two people or any team member that had taken care of them. After the, um, the one died, the other spouse, the spouse decided to go home where he has recovered. Later, we had a resident in our memory care who was sent to Memorial Hospital of Texas County for some medical issues. They chose to do a COVID test because of some of his signs and symptoms, and that came up positive after a couple of days. So they sent him to Alliance Woodward Hospital while he was there, he was tested two more times. He came up negative on all of his tests at Woodward. So then he was returned to us on a skilled basis, then IV antibiotics for seven days. And he is still a resident with us and has showed no more signs and symptoms. Our two team members were both immediately placed under quarantine. And I think you hear more about how the health department follows those, but we could not let them come back to work until we got the letter from the Oklahoma State Department of Health and the Texas County Health Department that says they are cleared to come back. Then they were put back on the schedule. Our team has been tested three times now, on April 30th, May 12th, and then we were tested again today. So we have had our brains tickled several times. The neighbors in the manor were all tested on April 30th, May 12th, and again today. The neighbors that live in the heritage and the memory were tested on May 12th and again today on May 28th. We've been in constant touch with the Region 1 Merck and our Texas County Emergency Preparedness. When we have needed things, we've been getting it. In the beginning, we did have some issues with getting enough masks and gowns. And a lot of that was because the state of Oklahoma did not have their stockpile in very good shape. Once they got their stuff from the federal government, we have had regular deliveries of our needed items. We do an inventory of the PB. PPE every day, count it all, and then we have this nice little form we have to fill out every day and email to our Merck Region 1 and to the Oklahoma State Department of Health. We were asked about staffing. It has not been a real huge issue for us due to COVID. We do have problems, as I think everybody in the panhandle has, recruiting enough CNAs, LPNs, and RNs. That is mostly because there is a shortage of medical personnel in the Oklahoma panhandle. The other issue is we do not have any, we teach CNAs, but there is no nursing program in the Oklahoma Panhandle that 
we can draw from. OPSU has an RN to BSN program, but it is all online. So that doesn't help us to gain people. And the LPN program in liberal doesn't really help us because the liberal long-term cares, assisted living and hospital grab them up as soon as they can. So nursing is always an issue to have enough nurses. And if you are a nurse and you want a great job with a great administrator in a great building, give me a call, 580-338-3186. We're gonna be continuing to follow all, follow all the CDC, CMS, and Oklahoma State Department of Health guidelines. When we're given any guidance on allowing visitation at the Manor, the Heritage, and the Heritage Memory Care, we're gonna abide by that. Once we are allowed to admit new residents without the quarantines and no visitation in place, I feel like our census will go back to our pre-COVID numbers and beyond. So that's what's going on at Dunaway Manor and Heritage Community. And I hope it was short enough, I tried. Um, I know I have some questions. I just want to also say from the bottom of my heart, I've been here since September 9th and this community has been awesome. They have supported us. I came into a building that was in extreme trouble. There'd been a large amount of money absconded and it was gone. And in my first week, I almost had to learn how to close the building because we were $60,000 short of making payroll. Thanks to a generous person in this community, we met payroll. And I can say that almost all of the back bills have now been paid off. We are operating in the black. We are making a profit and we are set. We still need you though. We love you and appreciate you. If you, can't, if you could come see those neighbors, which I hope you can soon, you would love watching them in the garden with those tomato plants and pepper plants and all of that stuff that you, the citizens of Texas County donated and gave to us for them. And so out of the bottom of my heart, thank you for supporting Dunaway Manor and Heritage Community. And please keep sending stuff. They love the cards and letters that all of you have been sending and keep that up. The last update I got from Mike Cook, who's the director of the Oklahoma State Department of Health, was that they believe they're gonna start loosening the regulations on June 12th and allow limited visitation. It will require reservations. It will require um, um, taking your temperature, wearing a mask, and visitation will be extremely limited. We're not gonna have to be able to let huge groups in like we did. At some point, we sure hope we do. So again, thank you, and I believe I have some questions. Yes, sir. The first question is, <laughs> why does the nursing home struggle with rapid testing? To my knowledge, we are not struggling with rapid testing because it has not been made available to us. We use what we're allowed to use, and the Oklahoma State Department of Health has told us when, how, and where, and they've showed up, and they've done the testing. The National Guard guy that did it today, I have to say, I think he really tickled my brain, but they have been great to work with. Um, I'll throw this in, there was an issue a lot of people have asked about our first test. They did a new sputum test that had Dr. Uh, Governor Stitt had decided to go with it. It had been tested, approved by CDC. That lab thought they could handle it. And when the tens of thousands of specimens began showing up, they didn't lose them. We eventually got those results, but it was about, it was way after we got our results from our second test that they finally came in. But we haven't been offered rapid testing. We're gonna to continue to work with the Oklahoma State Department of Health and whatever they're doing is what's gonna be done in our building. Second question is, what is the exact days on hand of PPE for, the, for, for your facility? Okay. I don't know the exact number of days. A lot of that, it's a fluid situation. So currently there's nobody in the building with COVID. There are eight people in the building though that are on isolation because of various issues. Some have gone to the hospital or to a doctor's office. Several had to go to dentist office. We have to isolate them when they come back from that. Several of them were worked with very closely by a team member, one of those team members that tested positive and out of an abundance of caution, they were all put on uh, quarantine which means they have to stay in their room, 
and all of our team when we go in had to wear masks and gowns and gloves to take care of them. Um, it, we have to use the red bags and the blue bags for all the trash and all their laundry and has to be done separate. So we don't have a set number of days. They've kind of set levels of the amount of PPE that they think we need based on our current needs in the building which would, would change drastically were we to get somebody in the building with COVID. And so then I would call uh, Paulette at the Merck Region 1. I would say, Paulette, I have positive and we need blah, blah, blah. And it gets to us. Sometimes Grant Wadley goes down and get it. Sometimes our uh, Texas County Emergency Management Team goes and gets it. And I even made the trip to beautiful slap out Oklahoma to pick it up. So. Again, the state has done a great job taking care of us. Our county emergency management has done a great job of taking care of us. There has been no PPE available on the open market. So without the state and the federal government, we would not be getting it. Okay, and the last question is, have you developed a long-term testing strategy for the fall and winter for the potential reoccurrence of the virus? At this time, I'd say no, we don't have one. I believe that probably the Oklahoma State Department of Health, that probably in Oklahoma City, I don't think locally they know that, but I'm sure they're looking at it. There's certainly been a lot of discussion about what's going to happen. Is it going to come back? What are we going to see is going to happen in Oklahoma because of Memorial Day and right here in Guymon, um, when a lot of people were out and had good times and now the Guymon swimming pool is open. Are we going to see a spike again? And we don't know. Are we gonna have a vaccine? We don't know. What we do know is that we have plans in place to deal with what we have to deal with. And we're gonna do whatever it takes. The Merck system has been set up um, probably 12 years now. And it was something that we didn't need big time. We haven't used it big time like we have. Once we hit this, we've used that Merck system huge. You know, we've been through all the meetings. Um, if you talk to Grant Wiley, he could tell you all the fun times we've had when they, and I think also you can hear from uh, Texas County Memorial Hospital, they, they send us out an email and say, imagine that your building is on fire and hope half your town is on fire. How would this affect you? Please report in the next 10 minutes. So we've had all this training. And if we need to deal with it in the fall, we have to shut the buildings again. Whatever we have to do, we'll do. But right now, there is no strategy that I know of for, for the fall and winter, except we're going to watch what's going on. We're going to take care of the people to the best of our ability. And whatever gets thrown at us, that's what we're going to deal with. We're going to stay panhandle strong no matter what. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Terry Salisbury. I'm the director of the Texas County Health Department. Um, since COVID-19 has come to Guymon, our staff has stayed especially busy with case investigations and contact tracing. Uh, all positive cases have to be notified and we interview them such for symptomology and link the duration of the symptoms in educate them on isolation and and case manage case management for them um, we also provide them isolation and quarantine guidelines along with contact tracking and monitoring which can include visits to homes if necessary so this takes a lot of employee staff time to accomplish all of this we've also been testing um, pods curbside and um, ensuring that the, the specimens are packaged adequately because every time we change a lab we have to change a requisition and so we have to also ensure that those the labs are delivered to the correct laboratory um, we've also done public information announcements and um, letters to employees with regards to their work status. Early in intervention has had to do tele 
uh, health at the health department and have been able to continue their services through um, video. The barriers that we are facing are um, staff capacity to perform the case investigations and contact monitoring. When you consider that we've had 900 plus cases in Guyman, or in Texas County, not Guyman, in Texas County, and we have four nurses that are available to do contact tracing. And if that's spread over a year, that's not bad. But when you spread it over a couple of months, it becomes a lot of work. Uh, we've also had a barrier with our labs and the capacity of the labs to do the testing that's needed in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, when the long-term care testing came down from Governor Stitt, everyone, every long-term care facility had to be tested. And we were on a timeline of like about two and a half weeks. And so all that had to be scheduled. Well, when all those long-term care facilities, when those test specimens hit the first lab, it overwhelmed them. And um, now, they were able to test, that wasn't the problem, but their data, downloading it to our system and getting it to the right location was the problem. So it took well over a month, which at that point, it's useless to even try to, um, for interpretation purposes. Um, another barrier has been inaccurate or no contact information on the lab slips we receive. We're not the only ones testing in town. We have um, physicians and the hospital and several other localities that test, and all those go. Primarily, we're the courier for all of those, and uh, the National Guard picks those up, and then along with our specimens, takes them to the same lab. So if we receive those positive results back and there's no telephone number or there's not a good address, then the case, con uh, the case investigators are required to go out and actually try to make a visit and locate that person and get a good phone number so that we can monitor. Uh, language barriers is, has been a problem, but we are fortunate that we have several interpreters at the health department along with the language line. And so we've been able to overcome that barrier. Plans for moving forward, uh, we want to continue encouraging prevention measures as towns and cities reopen. Uh, of course, we'll continue with case and contact notification and monitoring. Uh, monitor the statistics to ensure that we're not seeing an increase or a rise in cases that indicates an outbreak. And uh, continue testing as needed. Okay, I'm ready for questions. Okay, the first one is, are the seaboard numbers included in the city or county number? If they are not, why is that? Okay. Yes, um, and I've had this question several times over the past couple of weeks. Yes, they are included in the Texas County numbers. Thank you. Um, every positive test has to be reported to the State Health Department if it's a communicable disease. And so these have to be reported. Um, on May 11th, when we actually started testing at Seaboard, the numbers in Guyman were 404 active cases, positive cases. May 19th, which would have been eight days later, the numbers were 784. So that's 380, a 380 case increase for Guyman, or for Texas County. Um, so that would include those. The reason that came in increments throughout that, that time period is we, we did twice a day um, trips to the Oklahoma City delivering specimens. So all 1,600 plus specimens didn't, weren't delivered to Oklahoma City at one time. They were delivered in batches three to 500. And so then the results came out over time. So that's why it's been a little confusing to, to folks, I think, because of, of the way the, the results came. Also keep in mind that not all Seaboard employees reside in Texas County. So some of those numbers, positives at Seaboard, may be reflected in another county or another state. Okay. Why aren't we seeing the total tested and how many are negative? Um, the, the total tested are not divided out by county. Uh, on the website, on OSDH website, uh, coronavirus, 
www.health.ok.gov. Those numbers can be found. The total number tested can be found. Um, but the lab, the public health lab can tell us how many they've tested for a certain county. But when you're when you're dealing with multiple labs, each of those labs would have to report for all 77 counties, and it's just too much of a data nightmare for them to be able to tally that. Okay. Who is determining how Texas County is reporting out numbers? Is OSDH reporting seaboard numbers? I think you've clarified that. Yes. And how can we be sure these numbers are counted? And you clarified that as well. I guess reporting of numbers, if yes. you want to clarify anything. Um, the Oklahoma state statutes require as well as public health rules, mandate communicable diseases are reported to the State Department of Health at the Acute Disease Service. And this is probably one of those things that until something like COVID-19 happens, most people don't even realize that's a part of the county and state health departments. And uh, because we investigate all communicable diseases, but um, all, all positives are included in in the numbers for each county of all communicable diseases. What was the determination process for, con for contracting with labs for Texas County specimens? Could we have contracted with someone with more capacity? Um, the State Health Department contract does all the contracts for um, the County Health Departments as a whole, like labs. Contracts. I mean, they don't contract with my maintenance here in Guyman, but, but for the entire state. When it's something involving the entire state, they do. So they were vetting labs as best they could, but this is a new d disease and it's a, a pandemic and no one had experienced it before, so the labs really didn't know what their capacity was until they were overwhelmed by it. And so... Um, a lot of lessons learned during all this, but um, we're, we're continuing to, to try to work through all the problems. Currently, we send specimens to three different labs. And um, so we have to manage, like I say, requisitions, making sure the right specimens go to the right lab and at the local level. So they're doing this all in an attempt to keep from overwhelming labs and be able to get results back in a timely manner. Now, the, this problem's not unique to Texas County or to the state of Oklahoma. Other states are having the same problem and it, it just comes part of, of a pandemic. Okay. How is tracing being done now and how will it be done in the future? Has the county hired or will the county hire and train individuals to support community tracing efforts? Okay, currently the resources from other parts of the State Department of Health, areas that have not been hit as hard as, as Texas County, they are being diverted to assist us with the large influx of positive cases in Texas County. So whether or not in the future we will hire someone and train them locally to do some of this will all depend on what our numbers do. We'll just have to monitor and um, then if we're and see where we're at when that happens and what the other, how the other counties of, in the state are. Uh, tracing, contact tracing right now is, is some's being done remotely and some's being done at Texas County Health Department. Um, but it involves making contact with the party daily and we, when we do, we assess their symptoms, their resource needs and compliance with isolation. As the numbers decrease, decrease, tracing will be done by a state phone bank and then we'll return probably to the county health department in our region, which I have, I'm over six of those. I have a 10 county region, but only six have health departments. So the nurses in those six will assist when the numbers decrease and then it will finally return to our Texas county health department nurses. Have we or should we be exploring a way to get faster test results? For example, some of our local doctors are able to get those test results in 15 minutes and the health department sometimes takes nine days to deliver those results to Texas County. 
um, the supplies for the rapid test, and it, particularly the reagent, uh, are very limited. And we have partnered with some of the physicians to assist them with some of those supplies. But for large-scale testing, it's not appropriate. We just don't have the number of tests that we need to do rapid testing here. We're in hopes that uh, shortly in the future we have a an antibody test that can be done with the blood test, which would be real good, and it would also tell us more about where they're at in the, the exposure recovery time um, or their resistance to the disease. Um, but at this time, we just don't have the supplies we need for rapid testing for everyone to, to be tested that way. Okay, next question. Have patients attribution issues related to zip code reporting been addressed? It's three parts, excuse me. The Texas County mortality rate appears skewed because of this, and can the attribution be mapped so we can have a, a, a better accurate account? Okay, I'm not real positive that, that I can answer this entirely, and so if the person would like to call me, they can call the local County Health Department, Texas County Health Department, and ask for me, and I'll be glad to call them back. But I will, I will tr attempt to answer what I think the question is. Um, right now, the patient's physical address, not the zip code, is used to identify the county. And the epidemiologist at the State Health Department utilize an app where they actually look that address up, and it tells them what town and county the person lives in. So um, the zip code, like if, if Guyman had two or three zip codes in the, you know, but that also extended to another settlement or something, that same zip code, um, that might skew the results. But the way that the cities are used, I don't, I don't think that there is, is as much chance of it being skewed. What is the exact days on hand for PPE at the health department? Um, today, when I went, they only had one day, and that was because we did some testing this week, and they were utilizing their PPE at the, the county health department, which it was, I mean, it's up for all of us. But anyway, they won't get a delivery. Uh, probably tomorrow they will get a delivery. We get one once a week. We typically have two to six days on hand, depending on the amount of testing we're doing and that sort of thing, but uh, typically two to six days. Who have we included in any of the dissemination of information for the immigrant community? Um, we have worked with faith-based organizations here in town, the public schools, and also uh, radio stations for diverse populations. We were started to run mask uh, infomercials, and uh, tomorrow one of the ladies that is, is here helping us from State Health Department We'll do an in interview with Enrique, Enrique from Liberal, I think. So we're, we're trying to reach them through, through their radio stations. Last question. What is the criteria for someone to be listed as recovered? Um, the CDC recommends that um, isolation be maintained for at least 10 days after an illness onset. So 10 days, they consider the onset of symptom is day, day zero, and then 10 days past that. So it's actually 11, on the 11th day, they're, they're out of isolation. Um, or at least three days, 72 hours after recovery. Illness onset is defined as the date symptoms began. Recovery is defined as the resolution of fever without the use of fever-reducing medications and with progressive improvement or resolution of other symptoms or 10 days after a positive test without signs and symptoms. And, a lot of, and I might point that out. Quite a few people uh, exhibit no symptoms at all. They test positive, but they never do have a, an actual illness that they can. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks for, for doing this. Hello, I'm Nancy Schmidt from the hospital. 
and um, I've been asked to update on current operations as they relate to COVID. And so when you come to the hospital, um, they will take your temperature and only those that need to come in actually get into the hospital. So families wait in cars, we give people, we have it translated in English and Spanish, um, an information sheet so that you can contact someone within the hospital to find out how it's going um, or, or what's occurring. So presently, um, if someone is positive and we know that they are positive, they come to the ED doors and we take them directly into isolation rooms and then figure out if they need hospitalization or if they don't need hospitalization. If they need hospitalization, Grant, who is still back there, brings an ambulance and we transport them to uh, Woodward or another surrounding hospital or wherever we can get a bed. Right now, we have the Army Corps of Engineers at the hospital and they are pouring cement pads outside of radiology so that we can transport patients into radiology without contaminating the hospital. As you know, the hospital is what is open to sick people that don't have COVID. And so every day we have people in the hospital. So we're extremely careful about spreading infection in the hospital and keeping it out of the hospital. And so on top of that, um, we are, the Army Corps of Engineers is there. You see them from the from the rooftops to the foundation and we are turning the OB unit which can still be used for that when COVID is over um, into isolation rooms with anti-rooms and anti-room is that you go in one place you're clean you change into PPE um, and you go into the room you come out the dirty side you come, you clean, you wash, take it off, someone watches you, and then you come out. So all of that is being built out for the community and um, FEMA and other agencies are helping us fund that. And so we're extraordinarily grateful um, because if COVID is over, hallelujah. If it's not over, then we have resources within the community. What it, the next question is, what is the biggest barrier facing us? And our biggest barrier is in relation to physicians, because if you have someone on a COVID unit, you have to have a physician immediately available 24 hours a day for that. So we have, we have um, that issue. Then we have the issue of nurses. So two patients, one nurse, um, four patients, two nurses on up to we can when they're done we can do eight beds and expand to 16 beds if we needed that in the community and then um, I think the most forgotten part of the team are the respiratory therapists because they put you on the vent they monitor the vent they do all of these things they're essential to any hospital with COVID and then we have of course the the techs that would be back there that monitor different equipment and stuff as it, it, it goes on. So all of that um, in eight more days will be completed and Diamond will have its own ability to take care of COVID patients. Um, um, the next question is what are our plans moving forward? I tell you that changes on a daily basis depending on what is coming down down from the CDC or other agencies and we adapt to the current situation as it changes and we know what we need to do we quickly what we, I call huddles put that together address the issue and put plans into place so that we cope and help the community cope 
with COVID. We've done a lot of work with Seaboard, and we do, have done a lot of work um, with the state health department. We're very grateful because they, we, we can get so many kits to test through our lab, and we could run out, but the state, who's over there, can't tell where I'm looking, um, um, provides us with those kits, and we help the state get testing so that we stay very current and everyone can get what they need. So I understand you have questions. We do. Uh, the only question that we have that you haven't addressed is what's the exact date on hand for PPE at the hospital? So I think this has been addressed over and over. Most of us out here, the only way we can get PPE is through the state um, Merck agency. And so they keep us supplied. We, as um, some other people say, um, we report it daily. And currently we have one to two weeks of supply. They replenish us every single week from Merck. And that whole routine is pretty down now for all the agencies uh, receiving and getting PPE. Yes, ma'am, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. We had a couple of questions come through. One of them was um, if anybody had a question who they, who they could submit that to. Um, you can submit your questions to info at guymanok.org. And what we're going to do is collect those and try to um, give the different representatives those questions and have them follow up. Um, I want to thank Sheila Martin with the City of Guymon and Miranda Gilbert with our management team. Um, they've done a great job in helping facilitate this and we definitely want to thank all of our representatives for taking part in this and stay safe. Thank you.